heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Ed, full earnings coverage ahead as we break down the results from Qualcomm, from Etsy. We push ahead to the all-important Apple out after the bell. Plus, we dive deep into the world of artificial intelligence and talk AI safety, as well as investing with Sound Ventures general partner, Ashton Kutcher. Plus, Alibaba weighing a US IPO for its online commerce business. Could that be valued at $39 billion? We'll bring you the latest details this hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. I'm looking at a Nasdaq under pressure. I'm looking at Ed nerves across the board. We are worried once more about the banking crisis that continues to unfold. Pat West being consumed. The speaking out is continuing. KBW Bank Index now at the trading at the lowest since September 2020. This is a macro picture. The Fed hikes, the ECB hikes. We are worried about the course for global economies here and we're worried about therefore your technology investing but notably the Nasdaq is actually your relative outperformer compared to the rest of the indices. VIX currently just trading a little bit elevated we're up above a 20 handle that clearly shows some nerves of course this is the fear index when it comes to equities. Move it on though because interestingly are we still going to see a benefit in crypto because it is aside from the traditional world of finance? Yes is your answer. Ed we're at 28,000 that's below that 30,000 level that we had been peaking past but the fact that we're still up more than a percentage point there is safety searching going on and it's not just government bonds yeah it's interesting to see bitcoin higher on days where there's still earnings concern there are downside movers on earnings qualcomm off by six percent its revenue outlook for the current period suggesting the smartphone slowdown is still there the inventory backlog is still there we're going to go deep on these earnings later in the show but etsy again giving actually quite a good forecast but investors not buying it and as we push ahead to apple after the bell we're off by a percentage point it's that regional bank story that's really playing out again caroline you look at pac west you look at western alliance there are two catalysts clearly driving those stocks if we bring them up on the wall. In Pat West's case, they basically denied a report. Uh, sorry, they basically said they denied a report looking at treated obstacles while Western Alliance, you know, everyone's talking to investors, trying to work out what's going on. You and I have been discussing this for a number of days, right? It's the idea about communication. What is the health of these banks yeah. and the viability to continue? Remember last week, it was that First Republic was not speaking out that caused all the jitters, yet we have commentary from both these banks and it's not helping the stocks. Both, I think, have paused at this point. Yeah, volatility front and centre, Ed. I note that this also is a continued global conversation. Don't forget the ECB raising rates today. Don't forget, I saw the data. UK deposits pulled by UK depositors at the moment from UK banks at a really rapid rate. They are worried about Silicon Valley Bank. They saw, of course, the jitters around Credit Suisse. This isn't just about the US banking system right now. Many wondering how people pull out money. But also remember the upside. The positive is that savers now have some sort of different options out there. They could go to the neobanks. They could go to the fintechs. There are yes. different sorts of high yield products on the market. Yeah, we discussed in the show about how the digital world allows you to pull money from wherever you have an account that much more quickly. It's kind of a mobile driven bank run that we've seen in the last few weeks. What's interesting, though, is like SVB basically operates as if nothing happened mm -hmm. after the FDIC st stepped in for the for this ring fence bank. JP Morgan steps in with First Republic. First Republic able to continue operating as a part of JP Morgan. But the systemic issues yeah. or concerns rather are still there. We yeah. don't know why they're not going away. Because interest rates are rising, Ed. And at the end of the day, yeah. this is a macro story. This is about the Federal Reserve that continues to raise rates in the face of inflation. And, of course, there's still relatively robust labor data. We've got a little bit of weakness in that labor market, the jobless claims today. We all eyes what happens in terms of non-farm payrolls up next. But, of course, we've got so much to discuss, particularly with the world of executives coming up right now. And we welcome, for Bloomberg TV and radio audiences, Joined by Brian Chesky of Airbnb, and I'm very pleased to say Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Emily, do you take away the conversation. Hey there, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, you've got your huge summer release out. Now, lots of different new features and categories. The one I want to focus on is rooms, which, is, as I know, the headline here feels a little like Groundhog Day because... Rooms were where you started. Yeah. What do you want? To, what's the real pain point you're trying to solve 
with these new features? Well, the primary pain point is that people, once again, just like when we started Airbnb in 2008, want an affordable way to travel. And the most of, one of the most affordable ways to travel is to stay in a room in someone's house. That's how Airbnb started. The average room on Airbnb is only $67 a night. But we talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people said they weren't comfortable staying in a room in someone's house. Who's the other person they're going to be staying with? So that's why we created this new thing called the Host Passport. The host passport is basically this really robust profile. We verify the identity of every host, and you, get, you can get to know the host before you book. We also have really cool privacy features, like we show if the bathroom is shared or private, and if there's going to be a lock in the bedroom door. <clears throat> so this is, I think, what we're trying to do. Additionally, we think this is a really good way to experience a local culture. If you want to go to a new city for the first time, this is a great way because you get to step in the shoes of someone who lives there. You, of course, invented Airbnb in the middle of the last recession, and here we are on the verge of another one, which, you know, obviously not good for consumers, potentially not good for travel. How much is the economic climate impacting this new release? It's absolutely impacting what people care about. A year ago, what people cared about primarily was flexibility. And so we launched Airbnb categories, which allow you to inspire you to be able to travel beyond any place you can think. Now I think the equation's changed. Now people really, really are focused on affordability more than they even were a year ago. Airbnb, that's our roots. I mean, our roots are started in affordable travel, being able to share space. So this is what we're really focused on. <clears throat> we're also just really trying to focus on providing a great service. So we've been really obsessed over the feedback we're getting from customers. We've been pouring over millions of pieces of feedback from customer service. We've been talking to guests and hosts. And based on that, we've made over 50 core improvements to the service based on feedback directly from our community. And so hopefully if people use Airbnb this summer, they'll find it's more affordable and even better level of service. You're seeing that with simpler, more affordable monthly stays. You've got priority customer service. You've got more transparent and upfront pricing. I know you're using AI and machine learning to make a lot of this work on the back end. How are you thinking about the AI hype cycle and is it going to be as big as everyone says it's going to be and what that means for Airbnb? It's probably going to be a lot bigger than everyone says it's going to be. You know, every few years there's a new AI hype, uh, there's a new technology hype cycle. But the reason why is because there have been technologies that have changed the world and changed how we all live. The internet, the personal computer revolution, mobile. AI will certainly be as big as all of them, maybe bigger than all of them combined. And I think this is just the very beginning. It's going to play out over a long period of time. It's happening quickly. It's going to change, I think, how people travel. It's going to change how we learn. It's going to change how we get care for. It's going to change a lot of things in society. What we're trying to do right now is, number one, we want to use the tools to make everyone at Airbnb more productive. I don't think this will replace people initially as much as we'll augment people and make them more productive. Two, I think it can help customer service. We have a very complicated customer service problem. We have millions of people living together every night from different countries. This will help augment our agents to provide better service faster. And finally, AI can be like the ultimate matchmaker. Imagine if your, your app being almost like the ultimate concierge, and they can match you whatever you're looking for. These are the near-term things. Beyond that, it's really up to everyone's imagination what you could do, mm. kind of like the computer 40 years ago. Talk to us about matching your talent for this new AI dawn. You say you want to be at the vanguard. Have you got the right people within the business to be building it for you? I absolutely think so. I mean, of course, we're still hiring. If people are really great at this area, we certainly want to talk to them. But we have one of the, one, we have a great team. I mean, we have people that have been working in this area for quite a long period of time. And the other thing I just want to say is, there's many different layers to the stack of AI. You have OpenAI or Google that are working on the base models. And we're not going to be a research lab building base models. That's like building bridges infrastructure. We'll build the cars on the bridge, so to speak, the applications. So what we're going to be really good at, I hope, is building personalized layers on top of AI. We can tune the models. And ultimately, I want Airbnb to feel like the kind of company that it knows you, it understands you, it learns about your preferences. And I think that's what we can use AI for. What's interesting, we've got one of our early backers coming on who's all about AI today, Ashton Kutcher. Oh, yeah. Also, we're thinking about how it can lead to more productivity, more profitability. <clears throat> Go back to your announcements that you're making. In this economic environment, we are thinking about how you can be more profitable. You're saying how you can be more affordable, reducing fees. Does that ultimately impact your bottom line in the longer term? I think that AI is going to affect everything. 
<coughs> AI is going to make people significantly more productive. AI is going to be able to also allow things to happen that you could never have done without that technology. Again, it's a little hard to know exactly what it's going to affect. I think it's going to reduce the cost of our service. I think it's going to make the product significantly more efficient. It's going to allow like engineers to be at least 30% more productive, eventually twice as productive. Wow. So that is the equivalent of a reduction of fixed costs or a lot more throughput. So those are the near-term things that we'll have. But beyond that, I think we're just getting started. I think we're at the beginning of something that we're probably many years from now going to look back in this period of time and remember being alive at this period and being at a seminal moment in history. That's what I think we're going to think about this period in AI. Brian, you've been hosting guests in your own home for the first time, and yeah. I'm so excited I got to take a peek. You're going to see that on my new show. I don't want to give too much away, but there were some Chesky's chips involved. <laughs> What are you learning from you know, your own experience hosting and how you want to integrate that back into Airbnb, you know, given you know, what you've been hearing from hosts and guests, whether it comes to fees or affordability or privacy? I mean, you know, I always feel like companies that create great products create them for themselves because then you have total empathy. You understand what the data means. And I wanted to be a host again. I was one of the first hosts with my roommate, 15 years ago in Airbnb. And as I started hosting again, I have people in my house with me. They stay in the guest room, I'm there with them. And it really helped me understand, number one, trust and safety is paramount. You know, we now verify the identity of every guest booking around the world on Airbnb. But it also helped me understand that we need to make hosting easy. And as we make the product easier for hosts, it will become a better experience for guests. And I'll give you one example. A lot of people have complained about fees on Airbnb and host charging cleaning fees. Well, as I started hosting, I noticed that it was kind of complicated to figure out how much to charge. And we weren't doing a great job coaching hosts about how to provide a great value to guests. And as you use the product, you start to see these things. And me hosting, this actually helped lead to some of the innovations that we announced yesterday. Brian Chesky, we thank you of Airbnb. And of course, our own Emily Chang. Back to you. Thank you. Let's go to AI. Earlier this week at Milken, actor and entrepreneur Ashton Kutcher said that companies not investing in AI will go out of business. But does that mean that all AI startups are equally good investments? Here's what Kostler Ventures founder Vinod Kostler told us yesterday. Have a listen. I would say there's many more bad AI startups than good startups. Uh, and it's very hard to differentiate if you're not experienced with AI. So I do think lots of bad investments will be made, but overall, more money will be made than lost, even if 90% of the startups fail, which they will. Sound Ventures' Ashton Kutcher joins us now for more. And on his firm recently closing its AI fund, oversubscribed about $240 million. It's, it's interesting, Ashton, because you're really focusing on foundational models. That's what jumped out at me from the announcement. That's where a lot of people are putting their, their activity. Why, why so focused there? So we, we have multiple vehicles. Our core vehicle will be focusing on the application layer. Um, and, and that's where there's going to be a, an absolute boom of, of uh, innovation uh, from business models that are being unleashed that were never possible before. Um, but our, our core uh, AI fund that we, we basically we saw in November when GPT was launched, we've been investing in AI for the last seven years, several companies that are narrow AI companies that are application based. But when we when we saw GPT, be launched, we realized that this was an absolute breakthrough. And and these foundational models are going to be the underpinning of the next absolute transformation for technology. When we, we first started investing in 2008, 2009, it was right around the mobile revolution. And companies that didn't didn't embrace that in a, in a forward basis um, uh, really struggled uh, but it also unleashed extraordinary new business models that never could have existed before when you had a GPS in your pocket when you had a camera in your pocket when you had a radio in your pocket when you had all of that capability in your pocket it unleashed these business models that were never possible before. And what's about to happen it, because of these m large transformer models that have so such extraordinary output, 
uh, we're going to see innovation and business models that were never capable before that are that are about to be launched. And, and yes. Look, and 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 that's that that is just going to be an absolute. Like and and what I said at Milken was that if you were a commerce company ten years ago and you didn't embrace e-commerce, you're probably not in business anymore. And I firmly believe that if you're a company today and you're not embracing the changes that are taking place with AI, you're going to be behind and you're going to have a hard time catching up. Ashton, I'm really interested in how quickly you moved on this thematic fund as well. Who are the LPs and how quickly did it come together? Uh, we, we pulled the fund together in about five weeks. Um, wow. and, and we have uh, an extraordinary, uh, we have a base of LPs that have been with us for years on end. So we, we have about a billion dollars under management at Sound Ventures and, and have been working with some really extraordinary LPs over the years. And so we reached out to them and said, hey, this is happening now. Um, these large transformer models, a lot of them, you look at OpenAI, you look at Anthropic, you look at Stability, they didn't, they didn't start yesterday. They've been around for a while, they've been building this. You look at what Google has been doing with DeepMind and Bard, um, and th th those, those companies have been in development for a while. What we've just seen is, is an extraordinary breakthrough where you can take a massive corpus of data and be able to index through it and, and create statistical, highly likely outputs that are beneficial uh, yeah. to humans. And these utilities are really, really valuable. It's, it, 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 it is going to exponentially change. I agree with everything that Brian yeah. uh, was saying uh, before I came on. This is going to change business forever, uh, and and we need to embrace it because right now this AI can be used to improve humanity. Um, I I actually look at it as an equity and an inclusion play, where you know it, it, as we commoditize things like legal advice and medical advice and education and personalize those things to down to the individual consumer. Um, all, all of a sudden, people that can't get a doctor on the phone or can't get a lawyer on the phone or can't get a pediatrician on the phone, they're, they're going to have access to these services and, and access to these services at an affordable price. Yeah. And I, I think that's extraordinary for, for humanity and extraordinary for all of us. It augments, but you mentioned education there. And I think about your exited portfolio company, Chegg, which lost about half of its market value over the course of the week because already ChatGPT is upending its own business model. What are you doing with your current portfolio, Ashton, to see around this corner to ensure that they are augmented rather than completely disrupted? So that was the very first thing that we did before we even thought about uh, putting a vehicle together to invest in these things, is we reached out to every one of our portfolio companies and said, how are you embracing this technology? How are you implementing this te technology? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think maybe um, from my perspective, the, uh, what happened with Chegg the other day is, is somewhat short-sighted. Um, Chegg is implementing GPT-4 into their product. They announced Chegmate. Um, and, and I think a lot of the value is going to fall yeah. to the incumbents. So if you have an extraordinary product, you have consumers, and you're implementing this, I think, there, I think value is going to fall to some of those incumbents. Um, and, and, and as it should, but and and don't dismiss the fact yes. that, that a lot of these companies have extraordinary data sets that are their own proprietary data sets, and they'll tune their own models on top of these large transformer models, which will will create unique uh, value propositions for consumers. Ashton, the word that keeps coming up time and time again is hype cycle, and being able to see wood for the trees, but also being able to understand that this isn't kind of like crypto, where yes, there's still ultimate value. We see it with the OGs like Bitcoin, but we have seen an upending in valuations of NFTs, an area that you were playing heavily in. How do you worry about some of the similarities there and how do you ensure that the same mistakes aren't remade? Well, I think the biggest mistake that was made in crypto was, is, and still is, just the absolute lack of clear cut regulation so people know what the rules are that they should be playing by. I think that there were a lot of companies 
that were assuming that blockchain technology could be used for a lot of different things that it really shouldn't have been used yeah. for. Look, it, it's a public ledger database. So it's really, blockchain's super valuable for any kind of transaction between two parties that don't trust one another. So if two parties don't trust one another, they want to transact, they want to transact out in the open so that everybody can see what that transaction is and have a con consistent, constant, historic ledger of those transactions. It's really valuable for that. Um, I actually think for artists that want to have enduring art out in the market and be able to timestamp this new piece of art as, hey, I made this at this date and everything else that comes after that is derivative of that. That's a that that it's extraordinarily valuable to have a public ledger for that. Yeah. I think some of the tokenization uh, that was taking place um, was was really short sighted and, and pretty manipulative. But the biggest problem was there was there's been no clear regulation. But there's, there's no clear regulation no, for AI either. Is that needed? Yes, it is needed. And 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 I think that uh, the most promising thing could because by the way, it's not just needed, it's needed badly. And, and yeah. I think that we've seen some extraordinarily intelligent people that have come out and and it said it's needed. Uh, and we need to really focus on this. I, yeah. I think the companies that are building this recognize that regulation is needed. And I think, and what I'm seeing that's really promising is the founders of these companies, the founders of Stability, the founders of Anthropic, the founders of OpenAI, Google, and otherwise are are really forward thinking about what regulation should be. Um, because I, I don't think anybody wants this to be an unfettered market. Yeah. And I think there are data privacy implications. I think there are data, There's what is the value of the data? Um, I, I think there's misinformation issues. I, I work really heavily in eliminating child sexual abuse material uh, from the internet. I think that's an issue that needs to be considered. Um, I, I think biases need to be considered. I think that the traceability of this data needs to be considered. All of these things need to be considered. The good news is, is that the founders of these companies and and the people that are building this technology, they're cognizant of it, mm. they're being proactive about it, they're considering what needs to be done and what good regulation would look like. Um, because it's really hard if you don't understand how this technology works to understand how to regulate it. And, and the truth is there's a lot of people that are, are fear mongering on general artificial intelligence and we're not there we we do not have general artificial intelligence yet um it, it, it's yeah. it's getting closer and we need to be really considering what the implications of that are but the benefits to society for the utilization of this technology are, are, are going to be extraordinary and what we don't want to do is have it regulated in a way that puts it inside of a box in box and 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 doesn't allow us to continue to innovate because this isn't just happening domestically. Right. This is happening all around the world. And 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 the push towards general artificial intelligence is is going to happen here, if not here, it's gonna happen in China, it's gonna happen all over the world. And the implications of it are gonna be massive. Well so said. we don't hamstring ourselves in a way where we are now behind and we're underneath the rock of somebody else's general AI. Hmm. And so so it ne it needs to be done in an intelligent, thoughtful, proactive way. And the good news is that the founders of these companies recognize that, realize that, and are being proactive about it. Ashton Kutcher, thanks for being proactive on the subject with us. Sound Ventures, co-founder, general partner. And we're going to stick so much more with what's happening in the private markets, but also what's happening in the public markets. Etsy earnings out last night. First quarter revenue, beating analyst estimates. Joining us now, Evercore ISI analyst, Shredda Kajuria. She has an outperform rating on the Etsy stock with a $120 price target. But ultimately, we're just talking about how AI is going to upend everything. And if you weren't an e-commerce player back in the day that managed to pivot, how are you seeing Etsy navigate these current macro conditions? Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Um, well, in terms of the in terms of Etsy platform, I mean, we first of all, just lay the land, uh, we do have an outperform rating, but we also had a tactical underperform rating into the print, uh, into the year, which we don't have right now because we remain near term cautious on Etsy. And the biggest reason really is that the macro environment is very unclear. There is a lot of volatility and there is a lot of um, choppy waters that creates uh, cloudiness in terms of lack of visibility of what's to come. And so Etsy, actually, the management team did comment on discretionary spend being pressured. 
Uh, there's a big shift of spend away from goods into services, and the lower household income uh, folks are actually uh, watching their spend even more closely. And so they're feeling the pressure, and the, some two of their biggest categories are home and living and crafts, and those uh, uh, are seeing pricing pressures as people are shifting away from higher-priced items to lower-priced items. All this put together, and we see pressure on Etsy stop-line growth, and we did see that. So in the first quarter, they did beat all the estimates, but the guidance for the second quarter suggests fairly muted trends. And most importantly, it is unclear what the back half of this year will bring, especially if we head into a deeper recession. So near term, I remain cautious, but long term, um, I'm bullish on the uh, on the platform. Shweta, good morning to you. I mean, a lot of your sell side colleagues complimented Etsy on its execution in that tough macro environment. They complimented Etsy on how they communicated guidance, but the stock's down significantly. Why are they not being rewarded for that? Well, because the, the execution has been good. This is a stellar management team. They have done a fantastic job in terms of turning around Etsy over the past several years. Now, the uh, the challenge is that there's not a ton of clarity on the back half. If we just take what the guidance calls for in the second quarter, uh, it is calling for a year-over-year -year decline, um, a meaningful decline at the low end of their guide, and then some uh, some growth at the high end of their guide. And so what that tells us is that the back half, we could potentially see low single-digit growth rate in GMS growth. And then what does that tell us about next year? And I think that's that's what's creating uh, uncertainty among among investors. And then just just one more point. There, there are definitely great things to call out. And that's yes. what probably some of the other other folks were talking about is new buyer growth came in strong. Uh, re, uh, they reactivated a lot of new uh, uh, other buyers as well. Those were those were pretty strong metrics. But at the same time, habitual buyers, which account for about 43 percent of their GMS, came in lighter than we thought. And that's that's something not to miss as well. Shweta Kajuria of Evercore, all things Etsy. Thank you so much. Now, coming up, the Biden administration meeting with CEOs from the top AI names, pressuring them to implement safeguards for the emerging technology. We're going to talk to Adam Wenchel, co-founder and CEO of Arthur, about the tools necessary to navigate the risks in artificial intelligence from San Francisco and from New York. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's turn to Qualcomm earnings, where the largest maker of smartphone processors offered a disappointing outlook on demand for mobile phones. Joining us here in San Francisco, Kunjan Sabani of Bloomberg Intelligence. I look at the forecast, $8.1 billion to $8.9 billion for the fiscal third. What does that tell us about the recovery for Qualcomm's end markets? You know, my mentor always used to tell me the longer the party, the bigger the hangover. And that's what, what exactly is happening here. Smartphone makers are not drawing down an inventory as fast as the company expected, and it's driven by lack of visible signs of demand coming back. So you have this combination of high inventories and low demand that's causing really the pain. Longer the party, bigger the hangover. I remember that one. I, I guess that our expectations at the beginning of this year were that inventories would clear up in the second quarter. What do we now think is going to happen in the rest of the year for the smartphone market, but also Qualcomm in particular? Um, so for, we expected the first half to be the bottom, which now looks to be kind of pushed out. And we don't think the recovery will come until the fourth quarter. Uh, there is no current trigger for the demand. The next trigger will be in September when Apple launches its flagship device and then going into December in the holiday season that generally spurs up demand. So until then, there is no clear trigger for demand to come back. The, the CFO mentioned their modem only customer, which is code for like Apple wink wink. And I think the idea is they'd done a big order earlier in the year. At Bloomberg Intelligence, you also sp spotted something about China. Yeah. What are we learning about Qualcomm in China? Um, so China is a big market for them. It's over 50% exposure for them. So uh, like China had, was the last to go in lockdowns, and that's where the demand has not come back yet. Um, so when we look at China data, we were expecting that coming second quarter, calendar second quarter, demand would start picking up, but we're not seeing the signals yes. for it to come back. And again, it's that we are no longer in the supply-constrained environment, so smartphone manufacturers don't have the incentive to overorder ahead 
in anticipating demand ahead. Let's, they, let's go back to Apple really quick. That, that, that commentary around modem on, only ordering earlier, what, how did that impact the guide going forward? Uh, so typically, they would start ordering up for the September launch, but because they had ordered, over-ordered ahead, they have enough inventory, and they're trying to order in time, looking at near-term demand instead of over-ordering. Kunjan Sabani, new to the team here at Bloomberg Intelligence. Caroline. Great conversation, Ed. Let's, well, go back to artificial intelligence again, shall we? Because, look, it's important on Capitol Hill, Vice President Kamala Harris, of course, will meet with leaders of major AI companies, including Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, to address the risks they can mitigate from their systems. Q, AI company Arthur, launching its new service called Arthur Shield. Look, it acts as a firewall to protect firms against the risks posed from large language models like ChatGPT. Arthur CEO Adam Wenschel joins us now to discuss in the news day in day out is the opportunity around artificial intelligence but the nerves around it too as Kamala Harris is currently discussing what worries are you seeing with your clients you serve some of the biggest banks you serve some of the key companies Department of Defense how is ChatGPT becoming a risk for them Absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the first thing is they see the opportunity, right? There's, you know, studies that have shown that in certain job families, they can get up to a 50% increase in productivity, which is just a game changer. But in the rush to kind of adopt it and take advantage of those, uh, those benefits, they run into a lot of walls. And those things include the fact that it makes things up, what some people term hallucinations, the mm -hmm. fact that it can leak back sensitive data that it was trained on or that it was asked about, um, the fact that it, sometimes it can return toxic or, or, or responses that aren't value aligned with uh, your organization and so you know we're helping our customers solve these problems so that they can take advantage of this game-changing technology describe how that happens because there are rivals to open AI's chat GPT looking at at least showing you where the information has come from how do you ensure that when we get incorrect information or indeed we're worried about data leaks we're flagged yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, these models fundamentally, they don't contain all the data they were trained on. They contain sort of some, like really uh, efficient summaries of it, right? And so they don't really know what's true and what's not true. What they know is what is probably could be likely to be true. And as they're making these determinations, there are certain flags and signals which you can uh, key off of to, gen to decide, like, what are the, how confident are we that this model knows what it's talking about? And that's what our, our, uh, our right research team has, has developed is the way to, to really kind of set threshold and block things that, you know, you really shouldn't be confident are, are correct because these are getting deployed into legal and medical contexts and, you know, business people. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're deploying them in this way and people are acting off them, there's real consequences to having misinformation information out there. How many of your clients just want an out and out ban of OpenAI's ChatGPT within the four walls of their businesses or virtual four walls? Because we just saw it with Samsung, for example. Yeah, the majority of them, absolutely. They're, you can't use the public uh, OpenAI. Um, they're starting to be able to stand it up with inside of Microsoft Azure uh, Security Zone, but even that, uh, there's, there's a number of problems that come with that because ultimately what these firms want to do is be able to take something like a ChatGPT, but then train it on, augment it with training it on their own data so that they can ask it questions that are you know, more informed by their, uh, their business knowledge. And and that's one of the areas where, um, you know, leaking that data back in the wrong context can be really harmful and really damaging. What, Ed, seems to be in every part of our conversation is the pros and the cons here. We just heard it from Ashton Kutcher. We're now talking about really cyber can be helped and hindered by this, right? Yeah, Adam, I'm interested for your take on this. I was at RSA conference last week and everyone's talking about generative AI balance between how useful it's going to be in making data secure and tracking attacks versus how dangerous it is in the hands of bad actors. Uh, Arthur sits at kind of the intersection of that. What's your view? Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, the, the, the risks around it are just beginning to be understood as it's rolled out in some of these large applications. And so I think we're, we're sort of at the, in the early days of, of really figuring out how to effectively operationalize LLMs and the benefits they bring. Um, but even in the early days, we've seen lots of examples of, of all sorts of problems that, you know, are just, just make it uh, prevent people from putting it into production without the appropriate safeguards. So Vice President Harris is, is welcoming all these great names across OpenAI, Microsoft today to have a conversation about artificial intelligence. When industry participants like you see something like that, what do you actually expect to come out of it? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a great first step and, and there's a lot of value in, in convening that. Um, and certainly there's a really important role for the government to play in this. And so I'm glad the conversation is getting started. My hope is that they also 
you know, solicit the opinions of not just the people um, making the technology, but those who are part of the process of actually deploying it in the world and making sure that it, it works properly and that it, uh, and that it you know, serves, serves its purpose in a credible and, and uh, unharmful way. All right, our thanks to Adam Wench, who are the co-founder and CEO. Now, Great, coming thanks for up, having me the on. female economy and why health tech matters more than ever. We'll discuss with Kate Ventures, Monique Woodard, about all of that coming up next. This is Bloomberg. We keep talking about the macro. We keep talking about the banking fallout as it continues to be a crisis. How is that impacting startups? Generative AI apparently seems to be some sort of green shoot for the venture capitalists out there in terms of the industry. But there's perhaps a broader area, higher growth potential, the female economy, from women's health tech to e-commerce and much more. That's the topic of Monique Woodard's white paper out today, and it's called Finding Alpha, the Trillion Dollar Female Economy. Kate Ventures founding partner and managing director Monique Woodard joins us right now and great to welcome you back Mini. Talk to us about sort of the focus you have. What problems do you want to solve for women that you think is so highly advantageous for investment too? Absolutely. So investors are always looking for these growth markets. And I think that women are an emerging consumer that has emerged for quite some time. Women are now, um, now control 85% of consumer spending. Um, they control a significant amount of assets, and that number is expected to triple over the next decade. Um, and that points to a few different things. It points to opportunities in, in consumer, like retail and e-commerce, of course, but also things like women health, women's health, femtech, and the care economy. Um, we have to figure out how both care and work get done as, women, as more women enter the workforce and uh, start to move up the ladder. You name check some companies, Maven Health, of course, which has been proven a unicorn and resilient in this headwind, macro headwind kind of environment. You mentioned him and hers, Carrot Fertility. I'm interested, though, like, why, why write this white paper? We talk a lot about, well, the need to invest in women, the need for female investors, people who look like you, managing the money. And yet, ultimately, things don't really change. What did you need to spell out here that was different? So the problem is twofold. You do have the problem of not enough investors investing in, in companies led by women founders and CEOs. But I also think there is, is an opportunity to show people that, look, there is a massive consumer market here that is being underinvested in. Um, and we are underinvesting in uh, companies and products that solve the problems and meet the needs of female consumers. And I think that is a really interesting opportunity to try to solve. Um, people don't, um, especially investors, don't change their behavior based on things that are nice to do. Mm -hmm. They change their behavior based on uh, the movement of capital markets and discovery of new growth markets. On that note, Monique, how actively have you discussed your thesis with your LPs, with other venture capital peers to try and make this into something more substantive in terms of deploying capital? Extremely active. It's the second layer of the Cake Ventures thesis. So um, Cake Ventures invest in companies that touch areas of demographic change that are changing technology. The second layer of the cake is the increased spending power of women. Um, and I, was, I have been very open about that with both my LPs, uh, the companies that I invest in. And I think that's why founders want to work with me. They know that I understand that this is not just a niche. It is uh, moving, women are moving into, you know, a majority position in a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways. And that presents a really compelling opportunity for both my investors in the fund and founders who are building businesses. Monique, how is the, the ongoing uh, regional banks crisis impacting you, your firm, but also your portfolio companies? Yeah, it's, it, you know, candidly, First Republic is my bank. Uh, I also have portfolio companies who bank with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, but looking broadly at the challenges that we've seen with Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, and, and now potentially PacWest, um, you know, I think the public has, has started to see these as very 
high dollar venture capital problems when regional banks are, you know, providers to small and medium sized businesses um, all over uh, all over America. And these are their customers. Um, I think it's become a challenging um, position that startups and small businesses and venture capitalists are all in. Um, and I think that we need regional banks. We need we don't need more consolidation, but I am very excited that J.P. Morgan is now taking over First Republic. Um, but we do need those regional banks to exist. You also and I need... worry about carry on. Sorry, I, I also worry about you know how it will affect underrepresented founders, mm -hmm. women founders, women who lead venture capital funds and the like. Yeah, access, equality, basically, and the worry that we revert to past behavior. I'm interested in how you're finding those portfolio companies that you have backed that are led by minorities. Are they getting follow on checks or indeed are they having to trim more than most? Are they perhaps more savvy with cash in this current environment to be able to weather this macro headwind storm? I, I find uh, women led companies and companies led by underrepresented founders to be really resilient in times of crisis. And I think that we are in a time of crisis. And I think those companies are proving themselves to be incredibly resilient. Um, unfortunately, many of them never had the kind of access to capital that their peers did. And so learned to do more with less. And so I think that has created uh, extremely strong companies that will weather the storm. But, you know, there are there are still firms out here like myself and like Cake Ventures that are actively investing in women and, and, and founders, entrepreneurs of all types. Monique Woodard, we could always talk longer for you. Thank you, Cake Ventures founding partner and managing director. Such a great conversation. Meanwhile, coming up, Ed, so much more to do with you from Waymo. Says it's ready to expand riders' offerings, giving riders in San Francisco and Phoenix area more options to get around town. We're going to talk a bit about dating, too, with the Waymo chief product officer, Ed. Yeah, that's Saswat Panigrahi. We're going to talk about that. Keeping our eyes, though, right now on Alibaba as its international online shopping unit is looking at a U.S. initial public offering as it weighs its options to spur growth for that business. And that includes major e-commerce brands Lazada and AliExpress. The firm's in the early stages of consideration around the IPO's size, which is yet to be determined. This is Bloomberg. Biggest U.S. IPO since 2021, and shares are popping as they start trading. Health company Kenview has begun its trading as a independent company from J&J, &J, and shares are on the rise. Tylenol, Band-Aid, all the sexy stuff, Ed, currently up for grabs, and it looks as though there's some interest in this particular stock after what has been kind of a drought in the overall world of initial public offerings. It was upsized. Yeah, look, the shares opened at $25.53 a share. They're kind of floating around that level. $3.8 billion raised from the IPO, biggest since 2021, as you say, Karen. Remember, this was Johnson & Johnson's consumer health business. They're essentially spinning it off. But this is one that we've been waiting for. A little bit of activity in the IPO market. Yeah, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America are leading this particular charge on the IPO front. And remember, this is a company that still perhaps has some overhanging concerns, legal concerns. Kenview already has been sued over talc injury claims and caution they might be subject to claims arising outside the US and Canada. But I gotta say it, I unfortunately was dosing up my kid with Tylenol last night. I was losing, using Listerine this morning. These things are pretty, pretty uh, resilient in the face of the economic basic. headwinds. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, we'll continue to monitor Kenview shares throughout the hour as they begin trading here on Bloomberg Television. Now, Alphabet's Waymo says it plans to expand its self-driving taxi service in its two main markets. Customers in the greater Phoenix area of Scottsdale and other neighboring cities will be able to hail rides from Waymo's driverless cars. Service will also offer trips in new neighborhoods here in San Francisco. Joining us now with the details is Saswat Panigrahi, Waymo's chief product officer. Welcome to the program, Saswat. That's the expansion, okay? So how do we now start measuring progress for Waymo? Yeah, hey Ed, great to be with you. Uh, yeah, it's an exciting time. Uh, you know, we have uh, been the first company to open up uh, uh, the first ride hailing service to the public, now expanding it to the largest contiguous service area on the planet with AV access, the first to serve airports, and we're expanding that. 
And in uh, San Francisco, as you alluded, we're expanding that as well. So what you can expect from us is we cross 10,000 trips uh, of or fully autonomous trips to riders. And we were going to 10x that over the course of, of the next year, roughly by about next summer. So more cities, uh, more uh, occasions, more riders, the same way more driver. Have you set a, a date or a target for full commercial deployment in any of these markets? Uh, Ed, I would say in Phoenix, we are in a full commercial deployment. You just download the app and ride. There's uh, no wait list. There's no NDA. There's no approvals. You just download the app and ride. So to give you an idea, during Super Bowl, we work with the host committee to deal with all the riders and visitors to Super Bowl. So that's pretty massive scale already. And now that if you look at it, we're covering most of major Metro Phoenix and anybody can download an app and ride. And we're pre seeing pretty healthy ridership as well as engagement, as well as retention. So I would say it's pretty commercial in uh, Phoenix already, full commercial deployment. And remind and our audience, are you... No, sorry, Saswak, continue. Yeah, and in San Francisco, uh, we have uh, tens of thousands of riders in our wait list. We're waiting for a paid permit to be able to begin charging them, but uh, we're still offering almost the entirety of the city and today have opened it up uh, North Beach as well as Fisherman's Wharf, some of the busiest locations of uh, San Francisco to trust your testers as well. There's a lot of discussion at the moment around artificial intelligence. My first exposure to that field was talking about machine learning in the context of training the perception side uh, and yep. the compute side of self-driving. So what are you doing in the field of AI? How are you ramping up? Are you using LLMs to improve your existing technology? Yeah, Ed, uh, I mean, we have been uh, focusing on machine learning for a very, very long time. And it's in l every part of our stack, everything from perception, like you mentioned, on how we perceive the world, how we predict other people's behavior, being able to distinguish when a pedestrian is standing by the a curb, but not intending to cross versus crossing. Uh, also in how we plan, how we drive through. Uh, in every part of it, there are deep learned models all across our stack. but also in simulation as well as in validation. For example, simulating right. rain, right. fog, and those things, there's a tremendous amount of machine learning, and we're staying at the cutting edge of it with our research and have published some of it as well. All right. Thank you to Saswat Panagrahi, Waymo's chief product officer. We'll get both of us in a Waymo car very soon. Caroline. <laughs> Excited for it. Meanwhile, well, we always talk about cars with Apple, but it never seems to be quite on the horizon. Let's talk about the here and the now. The earnings are out after the bell. For a preview, let's go to Mark Gurman. And look, we're likely to see sales drop again. Yeah, there will be no Apple car announced today uh, during earnings. Uh, like you said, in terms of Apple earnings today, yeah, we're likely looking at another 5%. Uh, sales decline. Don't take my word for it. That's what Apple said would be the case uh, when it provided its its color uh, on the current quarter during its last earnings call, right? Traditionally, they like to go a little bit under to show more of a beat, uh, but it does seem likely based on everything that Wall Street is saying, combined with what Apple is saying, that we are likely in for revenue around $92 billion, uh, which would be a decline from around $97.3 billion reported in the year ago quarter. Uh, this will be the second quarter in a row where Apple's going to show an annual decline. So that's something that's obviously concerning. Uh, last quarter around, they had a bit of an explanation, right? The iPhone 14 Pro had major supply chain constraints. They were just not able to produce, uh, produce them because of the COVID zero policies at the time in China. Now, I'm curious to see what they're going to say the reason for this decline is, whether that's the economy, uh, maybe there are supply chain issues we don't know about. So we'll be interested to see how that goes later today. Can't wait to see you on the blog, Mark Gurman. We thank you. Meanwhile, well, we've got some action in the IPO market, don't we, Ed? Finally, the popping of Kenview. Yeah, look, we're still trading around that $25.50 mark, but eagerly anticipate because we finally got a big IPO, the biggest since 2021. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yep, don't forget, recap the podcast wherever you get yours. This is Bloomberg.